Um, I hope everyone can hear me. I hope uh, the screen is clear. Uh, I hope the presentation is visible, inshallah. So to continue, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. An Ummi al-Mu'minin, Ummi Abdullah Aisha radiyallahu anha, qalat, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fahuwa rad, rawahu al-Bukhari wa Muslim. Uh, and Rasulullah uh, says, and this is another riwayah, fi riwayat fi Muslim, man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fahuwa rad. So the wording is slightly different. Uh, the wording is slightly different, uh, but uh, the um, the meanings are there, inshallah, and we'll go through that. Uh, do you have to have the... Uh, I've been asked to leave the camera on. Uh, um, I've been asked by the organizers to leave the camera, inshallah. Um if there's many requests, maybe uh, the they will be able to change the um, the instruction they've given me. But as of now, I've been asked to leave it on, inshallah. Um, the translation of the uh, hadith, uh, it says on the authority, uh, on the mother of the faithful, Umm al Right, we know that the uh, me uh, the the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, all of his wives, they are the mothers of the believers. Uh, they are ummahatul mu'minin, uh, and uh, this is how Allah subhanahu wa taala describes them in the Quran. Wa azwajuhu ummahatukum, and his wives are your mothers. May Allah be pleased with them all. And so Aisha radhiyallahu anha, may, may Allah be pleased with her. She said. Uh, and of course, she's described as Umm Abdullah, the mother of Abdullah, the son of Rasulullah. Of course, he passed away while he was still young. Uh, she said that Rasulullah says, said that Man uh, Ahdatha, whoever innovates, uh, creates something new uh, in this matter of ours, referring to the religion of Islam, something that is not from it, something that is not part of uh, the religion, it uh, they will have it rejected. Uh, they will. Uh, you know this this whatever they've made whatever they've invented whatever they've brought into islam it will be taken away or it will not be accepted as something as part of islam and of course this is what you find in al-bukhari and muslim and the hadith themselves right you find in one book of hadith there might be five six seven even different uh narrations of the same hadith some of them might have slightly different variations, slightly different wordings. Just like me, I'm saying something today. Tomorrow, I might say the same thing. It might be slightly different. Or there's a, you know, a few of you that are listening to uh, the course or to the lecture. Someone might uh, tell someone else that, look, oh, Ustad said this. And someone else might say he said this. And I've said you know the same thing, but they've just worded it slightly differently. That's what it is. So in one version by Muslim, we find that he who does not, uh, or he who does any action which we have not commanded, which Allah subhanahu wa taala has not commanded, or Rasulullah has not commanded, then it will be rejected. And so both of them are uh, you know mentioned as the same thing. Um, the the hadith, the, the meanings are pretty much the uh, you know the, the same, but we're going to explain bi'idhnillahi taala. So if we start by explaining the criterion itself, or uh, the criterion is uh, the singular of criteria. So if there are criteria, there are many uh, different things that you have to go through to get to a certain thing or to do a certain thing. Criterion is one, okay? So this hadith, this one hadith is used as a criterion for judging the external actions of uh, doing any sort of ibadat, okay? Any ibadat that we do, this hadith is used to judge the external actions. Now, if we go back to the first hadith, you find the third point here, right? The first hadith that we covered, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ niyat, The intentions. The intentions judge the internal aspects of your ibadat, of performing and practicing Islam. And this hadith deals with the external. So those two hadith, them together, they encompass the entirety of Islam according to some of the uh, ulama. Some of the uh, ulama amongst the salaf. Okay? So if an action is not done in accordance to the sunnah, uh, of Rasulullah according to the Sharia that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down, then it will be completely rejected. It will not be accepted by Allah based on this hadith. Not just that it won't be accepted by Allah, but it will be rejected from the religion of Islam entirely. 
Now, without fulfilling both the internal aspect and also the external aspect, the deed won't be accepted. So this hadith is essential. It's something that we must know. And it's a short hadith, so it's very easy to memorize. Let me go back to the uh, Arabic, inshallah. Uh, so uh, Aisha, radiallahu anha, she uh, recorded that Rasulullah says, Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fahuwa rad. Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu Whoever innovates, invents something in this matter of ours, in this Islam of ours, what is not from it, it is not from their religion. It is not from it. Okay, so there's three uh, kind of sections to the hadith. Okay. So there are conditions, right? And the ulama, they mention the conditions. If anyone has the microphone on, inshallah, if you can uh, please uh, try to mute, uh, keep your microphones muted. Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, the scholars say that the acceptance of any actions of ibadah is based on two conditions. And you'll find those uh, in the hadith. Um, the intention, it must be done, uh, the, the hadith that we've covered before I'm referring to. The intentions that uh, the when you do the action, you must have the intention behind it. You must have this uh, sincerely for the sake of Allah. Ikhlas. It must be done for the sake of Allah. And we've discussed that in one of the previous hadith. And then, of course, it must be done in accordance to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If it is not done uh, in accordance with the sunnah, and of course, the, the Quran is part of the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, since he is the one that has brought this Quran, he was the living Quran. So when we say sunnah, it does uh, or it can include the, uh, the, the the Quran, but it means the Quran. Of course, it doesn't include the actions of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In any case, it must be done in accordance to what Rasulullah sallallahu taught us. Um, the Quran it also gives us the criteria for deeds being accepted. You find in Surah Al Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa taala tells us, "فَعَذَبِ اللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُو لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا Whoever looks forward to meeting his sustainer, his maker, on the day of judgment, of course, let him do righteous deeds. فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا Along with يَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا Let him not make shirk with Allah in his worship. Subhanallah bihamdi. So, let him do the righteous deeds and let him not make shirk, let him not associate anything along with it. So these are the two conditions that are given in the Qur'an. So, uh, Tawheed, or sincerely for the sake of Allah, and then it must be something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, or Rasulullah has taught us. Uh, let him do righteous deeds. These deeds, they have to be according to Quran and Sunnah. Uh, inshallah, uh, in the slides that follow. Let us uh, come to the beginning uh, once again, right? What does the hadith start with? Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha. Whoever innovates something, invent something, make something new. في أمرنا هذا في أمرنا. أمرنا is our religion, our deen. Allah subhanahu wa taala tells us about this deen, about this religion. فَعَذَبِ اللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ And of course, the ayat continues. Or well, the ayat itself, it will continue. But Allah subhanahu wa taala, He says that today I have completed my religion for you. In Surah Al-Maidah is the verse. Um, I have completed my religion for you. So we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave anything that is good, anything that is bad, but he told us about it. He didn't tell us, or he didn't leave out anything good that we're supposed to do, and it's not in the Quran, or it's not uh, in the instruction of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nor is there anything bad, except that he told us this is bad, don't go near it, right? You won't find any single thing in the world today. Even things that are being invented now and new things, right? Still, the guidelines are there in the Quran and the Sunnah, and we know about these. Are they good? Are they bad? Our morality is being defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already. We have the innate nature, of course, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also defined morality for us. And of course, uh, another verse that uh, uh, backs this up uh, or you know adds to it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nahl, uh, that uh, we have brought down this Quran and Zalna uh, ilayk al Qurana li tubayyana lil nasi ma nuzila ilayhim. That uh, we brought down this Quran, we revealed this Quran to you so that it explains everything. It will explain everything. So we understand that this religion, this deen of ours, is comprehensive. It includes everything. Uh, Al Imam ibn al Qayyim he tells us about Islam that the message of Islam it's not just for the Muslims, it's not just for the humans, it's not just for the males, it's not just for the young. 
It's for everyone, young and old, male and female, the Muslims and non-Muslims, the mankind and jinn kind as well. Uh, the message is sufficient. It's enough, right? If you take Islam and only Islam, the messages that are contained within Islam, you, it is enough for you to live your life. It is remedial. It resolves any issues that people can have. It is general. It is not uh, just khas for one situation, one time, one place, one people. No, it's for everyone and uh, uh, all time. Now, you know, Islam, we said, it's not just about the Quran. We must also uh, obey the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. We must also make sure that we follow the sunnah of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Because Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, says, uh, you know, that this is something we find within the Quran. It's an obligation in the Quran. So Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا That verily, indeed, definitely, in the Messenger of Allah, you have the best of examples to follow, to emulate. This is for everyone or anyone that looks forward to Allah. Of course, this means that they look forward to meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they know that the last day will come. So they're looking forward to that. They are preparing themselves well for that last day. And they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly. Always they're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one of the qualities, the characteristics of a mu'min, of a believer, that they constantly make dhikr. They remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Al Imran, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Say, Ya Rasulullah of course, that if you truly love Allah, so say to the believers, right? And this is, uh, you know, Rasulullah SAW saying to us, right? Even though we're not there, still we are the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu uh, Alaihi So let us uh, also say uh, along with, uh, you know, or act along uh, with this verse. And if you love Allah, so if we, all of us, if we truly love Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, follow me, as in follow the Prophet, follow the Hadith, follow the rulings that are given, the Ahkam that are given in the Hadith. So if we do that, uh, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you and forgive you your sins on top of that, subhanallah bihamdi. Whenever, a general rule by the way, whenever we talk about the rewards or the blessings Allah gives us for in a certain action, then he usually gives us not just once, but twice, and sometimes, a lot of the time, three times, subhanallah. So this is just a general rule. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you something, it is not just he gives you, but he gives you and he gives you, and then often he gives you again. So one, two, and three things. He gives you always more than one thing. Um, now, following the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, we also know that Rasulullah, whenever he would begin his khutab, his sermons, his maw'idha, or his wa'ad, right? He would begin with words that are, you know, the, the, the khutaba, or the people who give the khutbah, the khatib of your local masjid, uh, for example. Usually, they would start with these, uh, uh, you know, this hadith. They would say, فَإِنَّ أَصْدَقَ الْحَدِيثِ كِتَابُ اللَّهِ وَخَيْرَ الْهَدْيُ أو وَخَيْرَ الْهَدْيِ هَدْيُ مُحَمَّدٍ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَشَرَ الْأُمُورِ مُحْدَثَاتُهَا وَكُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ Verily, the most truthful speech, the best thing that you could say, right? What is the ultimate truth is the book of Allah. The best guidance is the guidance. Uh, if we can keep the uh, sound muted, please. جزاكم الله خيرا uh, the best of speech is the, uh, or the best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu And the worst of affairs, right, are those that are introduced into the religion without any basis, without, uh, you know, anything uh, that you have found in terms of evidence. Uh, if there are those that are raising hands, if you can, Jazakumullah uh, Khairan, uh, I can block the sound. Yes, I have muted them as soon as I've realized. And uh, anyone that's raising hand for a question, you can put it in the chat. And afterwards, uh, at the end of the uh, presentation, we will have time to ask questions. Jazakumullahu uh, khairan. So Rasulullah usually he would start the uh, khutbahs by uh, mentioning all of this. Um, nah. Now, we, we carry on. The hadith says, right, again from the beginning, Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha, whoever innovates something new in this religion of ours, in this matter of ours, fi amrina hadha. We talked about the matter, which is Islam, which is the religion, which is the Quran and the Sunnah. Now, ahdatha, man ahdatha, uh, what is an innovation or what is something ahdatha, right? Um, then we use the word bid'ah, of course, bid'ah and uh, something that is muhdath, right? They are the same thing. 
right? If I have done something that is muhdath, I have made a bid'ah. I have done a bid'ah. They are the same thing. Uh, the Islamic definition for bid'ah, right? It comes from this hadith. So we take the entire hadith again. Man ahdatha, something that is newly invented, something that is, uh, you know, created new, right? Fi amrina hada, it is ascribed to the religion, right? It is not just uh, something that I do in my life, but it is something specifically in terms of our ibadat, worshipping Allah, or in terms of the deen of Islam. Ma uh, laysa minhu, that which does not belong in it, that which I didn't find in the Quran, I didn't find in the hadith. So it has no basis in the religion. That is what defines bid'ah. These three conditions must be met. Um, and there are types of uh, innovations. Different different people might be doing different things. Someone might be using a hadith that is mawdu' that is made up, that is fabricated. And they use this as evidence and they do uh, an action of ibadah. So then this is something that is a bid'ah. Uh, someone might be doing something based on a dream that they had or a dream of a, a, a abid, a zahid, someone that worships Allah, someone that's an ascetic, right? Someone that doesn't concern themselves with the dunya, they are worshipping Allah. So they are known as someone that is holy, for example, right? They uh, base upon the opinion of that person or a scholar, right? Someone that says something, they're giving a talk and they said something, right? And they've do, they're doing the actions based on the actions or the speech of that person. Subhanallah. It becomes a bid'ah because it is not part of uh, the religion. It's just because someone told you to do it. Right. For example, someone says, OK, if you recite uh, Surah Yasin 50 times, uh, you know, every night, then you will get X reward. You'll get, uh, you know, uh, whatever, whatever it is, someone made something up. Right. Something like that. It's made up. Where did the, uh, you know, where did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that? Where did uh, it come in, in the hadith of Rasulullah? He did not. So they just made it up. That's why it will be uh, you know, rejected. It will completely be a bid'ah. Actions which Rasulullah himself did, the messenger himself did, alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, or sorry, rather didn't do, right? Not he did, but he didn't do, and he was able to do it. Yeah, he was able to do it. For example, and this is very common, right? The niyyah before the prayer, right? When you stand, stand for the prayer, uh, some of us might have been taught when we were younger, or even nowadays, maybe uh, you know some some people could be practicing this that when they stand for the salah, na way to an usalliya lillahi arba rakaatin salat al dhuhri lillahi taala khalisat al niwajhi and so on and so forth, right? This is not something Rasulullah sallallahu taught us, right? Rather, the ulama taught us, right, to say something like that so that we can have the intention perfectly, right? But Rasulullah sallallahu didn't speak the intention like this. So as long as we know that we are praying dhuhr and it's the time of dhuhr and we're praying for rakaa and it is for Allah. So our intention is in our heart. This is how Rasulullah taught us. He didn't say anything, rather he kept the intention there. So by continuously saying this, if it's for learning, that I'm just uh, trying to learn it once or twice and uh, j just for learning, maybe, again, not definitely, but maybe it could be allowed. Subhanallah. Then we have, for example, the uh, dua after the uh, salah. The ulama or some of the ulama, right? They have given the justification that, oh, we are allowed to do this because we're teaching the people and uh, so on. But then by doing that, nowadays it's become a norm in many of the masajid. So then we consider that it has become a bid'ah. Even though it might not have started as a bid'ah, it has become a bid'ah. Because now people don't get up from the salah without doing the dua. They say, assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, then they wait. When the imam says, Allahumma anta salamu mika salam, and then he says, he continues three duas, then he says, ameen. And then we stand up and we leave. So then it has become a bid'ah, even if it wasn't a bid'ah to start with. Right? To start with, it was done to show the people, to teach the people. For example, myself, after Salatul Asr during the month of Ramadan, we do a short talk or a short khatira speaking about the juz that we will recite uh, tonight in Taraweeh. We take some lessons from the Quran, right? If we consider that this is part of Islam, we must do it. It becomes a bid'ah. But if we're doing it to teach the people, Alhamdulillah, it's fine. And then, and then if we are also... If you can just uh, give me one second... I, I believe there might be a setting here that I can disable everyone from switching the microphone on. Uh, we're having too many disturbances today. Please just bear with me. Uh, test. I can't find that option here. If admin is uh, is here, inshallah, they can uh, maybe able to sort that out for us. Jazakumullahu kull al khair. Now, um, so we were talking about the... Uh, Naam, uh, after the Salat al-Asr, for example. And then we know that after the uh, Salat al-Fajr and after the Asr, we do the Adhkar of the morning and the evening. Adhkar al-Sabah wal masa So when I do uh, the class after the Asr, then I tell the congregation, look, uh, the, one of the sunnah of the Prophet is to do the Adhkar. So then I recite two or three of the Adhkar to teach the people. 
right? And again, as long as you make it clear that, okay, we're not doing this together, all of us together, because it's done, uh, you know, in a group, but I'm doing this so that you can learn this adhkar and go and do it yourselves. As long as we make that clear, alhamdulillah, it should be fine. But if we make it a part of, uh, you know, after Salat al we're going to sit there and we won't leave until the Imam has done some adhkar and some dua and then we will get up and leave. So then it will become a bid'ah. Then we have actions that the Sahaba didn't do. I'm not going to go in, uh, in too much depth in, the, uh, in, the, in this one. But Salat al uh, Salat al Taraweeh is an excellent example of this one. The Sahaba did do it. So uh, that, that's why we also do Salat al Taraweeh. We pray ourselves. But something the Sahaba didn't do, um, it could be even celebrating uh, the uh, birth or death of someone. And they didn't uh, even celebrate the uh, birth or the death of the Prophet. So we don't do that either. Something which goes against the Sharia ah or the objectives of the Sharia, ah, which, which are known as the maqasid of the Sharia, ah, uh, we don't do that uh, either. Um, if we want to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with new actions, with something new. So if I want to pray nawafil, I can pray any nafil that I want. You know, two rakah, two rakah, two rakah, two rakah. But then if I say, okay, four is better than two, so let me pray four rakah instead. And it's more than two, so it will be, it will be better. So then this is a bit ah in seeking to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or if I say, oh, every day after Salatul Dhuhr, I'm going to make a, spe a special dua. And I'm going to make this uh, something that I do to get close to Allah. If I have legislated this for myself, it can become a bid'ah. But if I'm just used to doing dua after all the salawat, then alhamdulillah, let me continue. That's not a problem. Um, if I want to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through haram means, someone says that, okay, if I take uh, um, you know, cocaine, right, I'm going to be high. And uh, I'm going to be more energetic so I can pray extra taraweeh and I can pray extra qiyamul layl. So then through a haram means I'm gaining energy or whatever it might be and I'm getting closer to Allah or I'm seeking to get closer to Allah. So this will be a, a, an innovation to use some sort of drugs to maintain my ibadah, for example. right? Or it could be um, that someone said, uh, I want to relax, I want to calm down uh, and I'm going to do, um, I, I want to do, uh, for example, the fasting, right? I'm, I'm going to be fasting. And if I take some sort of, uh, uh, you know, drugs, then uh, I will not feel hungry. So again, that we would be using something haram, right? To get uh, closer to Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala or to do my ibadah. This, this will be something that is a bid'ah. Becoming extreme in our action. Be becoming extreme, right? It's to say every single day of my life, I'm going to be fasting. Or every single night, I'm not going to sleep all night. I'm going to pray all night. And then uh, after Fajr, then I'm going to sleep. So this is something that is extreme that was not done by Rasulullah Rather, when the Sahabi, uh, or it could be a Sahabiyah, I cannot remember, uh, came and complained to Rasulullah then Prophet said, no, your body also has a haqq, has a right upon you. You can't do that. Right? So it will be a bid'ah. Um, changing how we are supposed to do any certain action. Like Salat al-Maghrib. Instead of praying three, I want to pray five because it's more. Or instead of uh, making two sajda, I want to make three sajda. Uh, things like that. Or instead of doing subhanAllah 33 times after the salah, I'm going to make it 66 instead. Of, I'm going to make it double. Yeah, this is not in the in the sunnah. The specific reward won't be there. But if I just want to make subhanallah, uh, you know, tasbih many times, this is perfectly fine, right? As long as I don't define it, I say I'm going to do in this manner, I'm going to do this number of, uh, you know, ibadat and so on and so forth. Uh, once again, the questions, inshallah, we will take them at the end. So you can write them in the chat and uh, we will answer them at the end, inshallah. Uh, how do we avoid bid'ah then, right? If these are all different types of bid'ah, how do we uh, avoid them? There are five general rules. The ulama have gathered these. We must maintain the following. Number one, that the time, the time of the ibadah should be done uh, at its legislated time. For example, the salah should be done at the time of the salah. Fajr should be done when you can differentiate between the two, uh, the white thread and the black thread. Yeah, the time of Fajr is known. So until the, from that time, until you see the sun is just, uh, you know, raising above the horizon or the disk of the sun is just about become visible, you need to, uh, or this is the time that Fajr, uh, you know, ends. Uh, and then as soon as the sun uh, you know, is rising, until it has risen, there is no salah that is allowed at that time. So again, it shouldn't be done at times that is legislated. Uh, and then uh, it uh, should be done at the time that it is legislated. Duha, for example, I'm talking about, it shouldn't uh, be done when the sun is still rising, only after it has finished rising. Right. What about fasting? Right. The fasting uh, needs to start at a specific time and end at a specific time. Also, during the month of Ramadan is when the fard fasting is. If I do it at a, at a different time, I say, look, this is Ramadan. I want to do the Ramadan fast in Shawwal. It will not be valid. 
Now, if it's making up like a qada, like I was sick and I had to break my fast and I'm making up, this is something different. This is, of, of course, it's been legislated. You're allowed to make that qada later on. But the actual Ramadan, I say, no, this is Ramadan today. Is Ramadan, there's still uh, 10 days of Ramadan left. I'm going to not fast the rest of the 10 days because, oh, I'm tired. I'm going to wait until the uh, winter months come and then I'm going to fast at that time. It won't be allowed. It will be bid'ah. Uh, make sure that we do the salah in the, or the ibadah in the correct place, right? If we do, uh, if we do a certain action in a different place, or I say, okay, I want to go, uh, instead of uh, going to Mecca for the uh, Hajj, instead now I'm going to go to uh, Rome and do Tawaf around the Colosseum, right? Uh, I'm going to go to, uh, you know, Dubai and do Tawaf around the Burj Khalifa, right? Will this be valid? It will not, it will never be accepted, right? This is called a bid'ah. So certain ibadat must be done in a certain place. For example, Hajj, you must go to Arafah and Mina and Muzdalifa, and there's a different order that you go to these places. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to go to another place and my action will be accepted. It won't be. What about I'tikaf? It, it, can, it cannot be done in, in the shopping mall. It must be done in the masjid, right? And certain scholars have allowed the woman to do it at home, but again, we're not going to go into that right now. Uh, the quantity, right? There are set numbers that have been legislated for certain ibadat. For example, the rak'at of the salah, Right, the tawaf as well, seven tawaf. You can't then say, I'm going to go and do 14 because it's uh, double and I will get more reward. No, this is not going to be valid. Of course, you can do tawaf later on again uh, and it will be a sunnah tawaf, right? That's not a problem. But at the moment of umrah or the hajj, you must do seven tawaf and that's it. That's over, finish, no more. When you're doing the tasbihat, I've mentioned that already 33 times, subhanallah, and alhamdulillah, and Allahu Akbar. Of course, there is a difference. It could be 33 or 34 times Allahu Akbar. But again, that's not uh, uh, you know, a bid'ah to do 33 or 34 because there are a hadith that back this up. Um, number five. Number four, rather. Method, the way we do a certain thing. Rasulullah showed us how to do the ibadat, right? Pray as if salluk, kama ra'aytumuni usalli, pray how you have seen me pray, right? So we don't do our prayer in a different manner, right? If you know that Rasulullah uh, he he you know, did takbir like this and uh, said Allahu Akbar, yeah, and he put his hand on his chest. So then we do it exactly like that. I can't then say, okay, to start the, the, the prayer, I'm going to do this instead, raise my hands all the way up to the sky. Because I want to reach uh, higher and show Allah that I care, to, uh, you know, a bit more. That will be a bid'ah. And then if I say, uh, when, I, when I'm, uh, you know, supposed to be putting my hands on my chest, uh, again, there's a difference of opinion, ikhtilaf, if it's supposed to be up here or down there or a bit lower. We're not talking about this, right? We're talking about the actual holding the hands. If I say, now I'm, I'm going to do this instead, right? Hold my shoulders, right? Instead of holding my uh, hands like this. This will be a bid'ah. Uh, so the method, the way we do certain things. And if I say I want to do the sajda first and then the ruku' later, again, this is uh, something that will not be allowed. And what about the type, right? There are certain types in certain ibadat that ha are written in the Qur'an and the hadith that we must follow. For example, zakat uh, is on uh, gold and silver. If I have diamonds, I own diamonds and rubies and emeralds. Do I need to give zakat on this? There is no zakat on that. If I own expensive clothes, do I need to give zakat on that? No. If I have a house, right, my own house that I live in, I don't give zakat on that. But a house that I own uh, for an investment purpose, I need to give zakat on that and so on and so forth, right? So there are types. And then when it comes to udhiya, sacrifice, right? Can I uh, sacrifice uh, something for the sake of Allah? Um, uh, for example, a chicken, right? When the time for Eid al-Adha comes, can I sacrifice a chicken? Can I sacrifice a very, very young baby goat? I cannot. It must be the type that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated, has allowed. Uh, and then when I give my zakat, again, I must give it to the correct type of people. Can I give to someone who is wealthy? I can't, right? And so on and so forth. Now, what is the difference between a sin and between a bid'ah, between innovation and between sin? There are similarities and differences, right? Both of them, they're similar, that both of them, they are despised, they are hated, right? And they're warned against, we warn people against the sin. Don't go uh, to close to this because it's haram, completely and utterly haram. We're not allowed to go close to it. And bid'ah as well, it is something that uh, we're not allowed to go near. It's something new that something someone has invented. We're not allowed to go near this. So uh, they are both sin. They are both ma'asiyah, right? Doing bid'ah, right? And doing uh, a sin, they are both despised. By the way, if someone didn't know and they committed a sin, they committed either an innovation or a sin, a mistake that they made, a, a ma'asiyah, right? They would not be judged for this if someone didn't know a certain thing. Yeah, if for, uh, for example, someone didn't know that uh, making the dua after the uh, uh, salah in the congregation, we consider this a bid'ah, that is something newly innovated, right? If someone did, doesn't know this, 
They are, you know, just the general public. We're not going to go to them and say, oh, you're committing sins. And No, we're not going to say that. We're going to educate them, teach them. After they know and they know the evidences, they know why we don't do it. If they still do it, then they will be blamed. Then they will be blameworthy. They might uh, be getting uh, sins for that. So they are both sins. Every single bid'ah is a sin, but not every single sin is a bid'ah. Right? There's a little bit of a difference there. They both have different levels. They can be major bid'ah and minor bid'ah. They can be major uh, sins and minor sins. Both of them, the sins and the bid'at, they are all destructive to the religion. They all, you know, chip away at a person's Islam. There are differences, of course. A sin has a dalil for his prohibition, right? A sin, you know, directly in the Quran, you find definitely that, oh, uh, Prophet or oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden this. For example, do not uh, drink alcohol. Um, but uh, uh, a bid'ah, you, you might not find a direct evidence in the Quran. Right, it's going to be more general, or in the hadith, of course. For example, uh, once again, we'll bring the example of the dua after the salah. We didn't find that Rasulullah he said directly, "Don't make a dua after salah together, all of you uh, in a congregation." Right. So, uh, innovation, uh, a bid'ah is not attributed to the religion, but a sin uh, uh, is attributed rather to a religion, uh, to the deen, to, to Islam. But a sin is not. Right. Someone's not going to say that uh, or Islam uh, you know, sh shows that you should be drinking. No. Right. So when someone knows uh, or when someone brings a sin, right, it's not generally attributed to Islam, but the bid'ah is attributed to the religion, to uh, the worship or to Islam. A sinner, usually you find that they repent from their sin, but the innovator, the one who is making something up himself, they, un they don't uh, you know, ask for forgiveness or repent. Why is this? Because if someone is doing something, they know it's made up. Right, they're doing it on purpose, right? A sin could be done by mistake. So a lot of the time you find the sinner, the one who commits a sin, they repent and they ask Allah for forgiveness, whereas the mubtadi'ah, they will not. They will not ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they might even believe that, oh, it's allowed to do. Then there's another slight difference um, between uh, your, uh, you know, not your, but between the bid'ah and between something that I do in my own daily life. For example, did Prophet uh, eat with a knife and fork? No, but uh, so that means if I eat with a knife and fork, is this bid'ah? Okay, this is number one. Then number two, um, the Prophet he never drove a car, rather he rode on a horse or a camel. So does, does that mean if I drive a car, it will be bid'ah? Okay, so number two, I can give many, many examples. I can carry on giving so many uh, different examples, but there's no need to do that. Uh, let us go through uh, the compilation here in the slides. So daily life versus worship, right? Daily life are your mu'amalat, right? And your worship is your ibadat. For example, Prophet ﷺ, uh, sometimes he would take off these top buttons, right? Um, he would take it off. Is this because now this is something considered part of the religion? Or is this because it is, uh, you know, a hot in uh, Arabia where he, where he was living and they just wanted some ventilation, some air, right? Prophet ﷺ, he wore a turban, right? Now, uh, does that mean that this is uh, a, a ibadah, that is worship of Allah to be wearing a turban? We should all wear a turban? Right. Uh, this is uh, something else. And then we can say, OK, what about the beard? Professor Salam, he said to keep the beard. Right. But then this one directly, he said that. Uh, so the men, they should leave their beards. That means we should grow the beard. So does that mean this is ibadah or this is muamalat or this is just daily life? Right. There's a slight difference with the beard and with how we dress or how we take off one button or keep one button, uh, you know, uh, closed. Now, myself, I'm not going to open this button because I feel like it looks smarter to keep it on. So this is Muamala, this is my daily life. This is how I just live my life because it just looks a bit smarter. I look, mashallah, a bit more, uh, you know, uh, if you, uh, by the way, I'm not saying that if I'm hot, I'm not going to take it off. I do take it off. And then when I'm not in this class, for example, I'm at home, I'm going to take off the thobe entirely so that I can be a bit more relaxed. Subhanallah. So this is not part of worshipping Allah in this manner. So this is part of my Muamala, my daily life. Ibadat is when you're worshipping Allah. With our ibadat, we know that something is haram by default unless the Quran shows us or the hadith uh, shows us or tells us. If we find that in the Quran it says I have to pray, that means I have to pray, right? Um, so everything else, all other prayers are haram unless I find it in the Quran or the hadith. If I want to make up a new prayer, right? I want to ask Allah for a certain thing and I want to make a prayer like that. So then that uh, prayer would not be allowed like this. We have such that shukr, for example. Right. Uh, if we find uh, that we want to thank Allah for something, we know that some of the prophets they uh, did this, and they, we find in the Quran, the Right. 
Of course, this uh, ayah that I have brought is فَخَرَ سَجِدًا وَأَنَابِتْ سَجِدَ of forgiveness. So we can do something like that. But uh, because we find it in the Quran, if we don't find it in the Quran, uh, we can make up prayers, meaning we can do qada. Yes, we can do qada. But making up prayers, for example, I want to pray an extra four rakah right now because I feel like it. I want to get close to Allah. We can't do that. But if I want to say I want to do nafal, two rakah, two rakah, two rakah, two rakah, to get closer to Allah, this is of course fine. We've, we've uh, explained that before, but again, uh, I thought it's uh, necessary to explain that again. So we can't make things up. Right, if I think, uh, okay, uh, the Quran has 114 surahs, now I'm going to make up uh, uh, another surah, right? First of all, you won't be able to, the Quran has given a challenge that uh, nobody will be able to bring a Quran. But uh, if I say, oh, I'm going to make this up and I'm going to read this in my salah, right? So then it will it will not be accepted, it will be a bid'ah. Uh, of course, it will be a sin as well. We said the sins, uh, we said the bid'ah, they are sins. For example, there are five times prayers. And the Quran, it gives us general guidelines about the five times prayers. But the sunnah or the hadith, they explain in depth. Did the Quran tell us uh, Fajr? Yes, it did. The, the, the word Fajr is in the Quran. What about Asr? Right? Is the Asr prayer mentioned in the Quran by name? Right? Subhanallah bihamdi. If we don't find it mentioned, so how do we know that we have to pray Asr? Right? And what about Dhuhr? Right? Did we find the, the word Dhuhr in the Quran? Right? Did we find the word uh, Maghrib in the Quran? Yes, it is. But it was referring to the uh, Mashriq and Maghrib, the East and the West, not the Maghrib prayer itself. Right, there are other words that are used to speak about these prayers, but in the, the hadith, they show us okay, the salawat are five, and you must pray like this in this manner, this many rakaat. Did the Quran tell us fajr is two rakaat? No, right? So, if someone says, okay, the Quran said uh, I must pray the morning prayer, fine, I will do it, but I'm going to pray three rakaat instead. So, we can't make this up, we can't change uh, it. So, in our ibadat, we must make sure we maintain whatever Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have taught us, have showed us. Now, in my mu'amalat, I can make things up, right? It's my daily life. It's my interactions. Um, I can eat uh, mashed potatoes. Prophet Wasallam. I don't think he ate mashed potatoes. Maybe they didn't even have potatoes at that time, right? So everything is halal by default until the Quran or the Hadith prohibit me from doing something. We can do everything except the prohibitions, except the haram. For example, every single drink in the world is halal, except for certain drinks. For example, something that will intoxicate me, alcohol and such, and blood. I can't drink blood, and so on and so forth, right? Um, if there, if I find a clear prohibition, then it will be haram, right? Every single type of clothing is halal. Every single type of clothing is halal, except if it goes against the rulings that Allah gave. There are certain uh, few things, which is what? Make sure I cover my aura. I can't wear like tight uh, jeans. I can't wear uh, tight form-fitting clothes, whether I'm a man or a woman, by the way. Uh, I shouldn't, right? Uh, you know, a man, obviously, the aura is from the navel to the knee, but it is not uh, part of, uh, you know, etiquette and adab for me, myself, as a man, to even wear, wear, wear tight, uh, you know, tops and vests and so on, and go out in public like this to show the people my figure, right? This is not uh, part of haya, <clears throat> as taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Of course, if there is a need, I'm working, I'm, uh, you know, working in construction and it's really hot and the man wants to take off the t-shirt and... Uh, generally, they're, they're out in a construction site somewhere, right? So that, that might that, that might be fine in front of the other men as well. You know, it's it's okay, right? I'm going to go swimming, right? Um, you know, the, the slightly different rule here because uh, now I'm going into the water and I'm not doing to show off and uh, show the people and there's not uh, uh, you know women around and so on. Fine, labas. But even myself, when if I go to swimming in a public pool. Right. Uh, sometimes there can be the sisters that are sitting on the side, even in a Muslim country. Right. They're sitting on the side. Maybe they accompanied their uh, children or something like that. And so then I, I would wear the T-shirt as well as the uh, shorts. Um, by the way, shorts means below the knees uh, for myself. And then I would go into the water. Alhamdulillah. No problem. Right. We follow the rules that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. We cover the aura. And then for the men, of course, we can't wear silk. So I can wear everything except for the silk. And I cover my aura and I can wear whatever I'd like. I can wear a thawb. I can wear a suit. I can even wear, uh, you know, a, a, a fancy dress. Subhanallah, as long as I don't resemble the uh, kuffar. Like uh, if, if I just wear something very, very nice, right, for a special occasion, uh, uh, occasion, for example, the wedding, and you want to wear, you know, uh, everything that you want to wear, all these, uh, fa you know, fancy clothes. Alhamdulillah, la ba's. Right, as long as it's not extravagant, there's no gold uh, on it, and there's no silk, wear it, no problem, inshallah. Of course, the sisters, you can wear your silk as well, la ba's, inshallah. 
Um, now, what can we benefit from this uh, hadith uh, or what uh, action points can we uh, take, something that we can do ourselves? We can appreciate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with a complete way of life. This religion is complete. We don't need to add anything to it. There's nothing that's been left out of it. Right? Until the end of time, there will be nothing that comes uh, up that I'm going to need to do a certain thing and it's not part of the religion. There will not be anything like that. Um, and we uh, are able to be thankful that all of the ways of earning the pleasure of Allah or the closeness to Allah has already been defined in the Quran and the Hadith. We don't need to do something new, something more. Um, if something is good for us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah, they would have told us about that already. There's no need for us to make something else up, something new up. Uh, and how do we avoid the innovations? Of course, we can look at the slides, inshallah, I'll send the PDF. Um, they can be more destructive than the sins themselves. So avoid falling into the bid'ah. Right? Because as we said, the sinner repents, innovator, they don't repent because they don't even know or sometimes they don't even consider what they're doing is a sin. Right? So let us be very, very careful about these. Uh, this hadith was relatively short. So inshallah, uh, we will end it here. I would have uh, loved to uh, go into the next hadith. But if we do, we will not be able to finish it. Um, it will take at least uh, about half an hour or so. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, Qabul, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tawfiq and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of our deeds and make them all sincerely uh, for his sake. There have been a few questions that are put in the chat inshallah so we will uh, go through those. Of course the uh, timing for the class has uh, slightly changed due to the British uh, summertime uh, change. So one hour uh, forward um, for those that are uh, from outside the UK and those that are within UK we're still at 3pm uh, as we were before. Now, so uh, Celebrating birthday is a bid'ah. Some of the scholars, the ones that have allowed birthdays, by the way, uh, I consider it a bid'ah, or um, uh, according to my understanding, according to the understanding of my uh, mashayikh, uh, we, uh, we consider it a bid'ah. But the scholars that have allowed it, I want you all to understand this. I don't want us to just uh, learn something and then just say, oh, it's because my teacher said, my sheikh said, and that's why, and the end of story. No. If we understand truly and properly, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. He always says, uh, albab. remember, reflect, because we are men or humans, people of understanding. Let us understand properly before we just say, oh, is bid'ah and is uh, shirk or is this or is that. Right? We don't want to just uh, put labels and we don't even know what we're talking about. So why uh, do we say it's bid'ah? Some of the scholars, the ones that said it's not bid'ah, right? they say that it's because, oh, it's not part of the religion and it's not uh, you know, something that we do to, to gain reward and to get closest, uh, closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, etc. Right? So that's why they've allowed it because they say, oh, it's just a cultural practice. But then we, we find that uh, Rasulullah tells us that when you are uh, you know, like or imitating a certain people, you become like them. Right? So uh, generally this culture, this practice, it has uh, been associated with the non-Muslims. So we don't want to be resembling the non-Muslims, so we, we we try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, so even uh, if we say that those scholars, they're being very, very harsh when they say that it's bid'ah. By the way, I don't believe that. I believe that it's, uh, you know, it will be something that is not allowed. Um, it's not from the Quran. It's, from the, it's, not, it's not from the Sunnah. But celebrating the birthday, not just of anyone, but specifically Rasulullah It was never done, not by him, not by the Sahaba, not by the Tabi'een. Right. So then uh, we will say it is a bid'ah because uh, they do they celebrate the birthday of Prophet specifically to gain some rewards or to worship Allah, uh, you know, extra and so on. They would say that, oh, Rasulullah, he, you know, he, he celebrated his own birthday by doing specific actions on his birthday. For example, the fasting. And we know this is Sahih. Prophet used to fast Monday and Thursday. He says, I was born on the Monday. That's why or was it the Thursday? In any case, he, I was born on one of the days. That's why I, I love to fast on this day because Allah gave me life on this day. This is fine. This is perfect. I can do the same by worshipping Allah and follow Prophet uh, fast on Monday and Thursday. right? And this will bring me closeness to Rasulullah. But to celebrate that, oh, he was born on uh, this day of Rabi'ul Al Awwal. So then this is what becomes a bid'ah. Now, uh, again, you can take that analogy, apply it to our own lives. If we can't celebrate the birthday of the best of the creation, so why should we celebrate our own birthdays as well? You can use these... Uh, you can use these... Uh, um, analogies but research this understand the issue properly he's praying ishraq from the sunnah of Rasulullah it is uh, a sunnah there are, it is known also by another name by salat al duha so uh, you know whichever one you do um, it is the same salat it is ishraq and duha it is the same prayer inshallah it is a sunnah of Rasulullah after the sun has risen uh, uh, the sun has risen to raka'ah of salah you pray uh, when someone passed to read Quran is bid'ah 
as in if someone has passed away, if you read the Quran, um, to recite or gather in a gathering in their house and recite uh, in this manner, it is not if, it is not from the Sunnah. We don't find it in the practice of Rasulullah nor the Sahaba. So this would be considered a bid'ah. Rather, what we can do, we can uh, you know give charity on their behalf. Uh, we can build a house for them. Uh, you know. Uh, as a house as in uh, build a house for someone else on behalf of them, build a masjid on behalf of them, plant a tree on behalf of them, uh, dig a water well or a tube well, uh, something like this on behalf of them and so on, a water pump, uh, for example. All of these things would be from the uh, sunnah that Rasulullah has uh, allowed us. Is the, In the bounty of Allah and his mercy, therein let them rejoice. That is better than what they amass. Yes, so this verse tells us we should be happy when we receive blessings and mercy. Of course, we must receive, uh, we must be happy when we receive uh, mercy and blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, accept all our deeds and grant us, all of us, barakah, uh, blessings, not just in this uh, life, but in the hereafter as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. We can make up prayers. If we don't pray 10 prayers, can we make it up? Um, now, making up prayers, again, there is a difference of opinion in this. I'm not going to go too much in, in, in depth, but someone who's missed their prayers for 10 years, how are they going to make it up? Some of the scholars in the past, they have said um, that, okay, so then with every salah for the next 10 years, you do one extra salah, so then you're making up for the last 10 years, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say in the Quran that he forgives what has passed. So if there are you know, a, a large number like this, right, uh, then the best thing to do is seek complete and uh, an utter forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because whatever has passed has been forgiven. If someone sincerely repents and then pray all of the prayers that are going forward, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, wallahu a'lam. And uh, uh, I believe that this would be uh, the best uh, opinion, inshallah. But uh, do check with your uh, local uh, shuyukh, inshallah. Is it fine to eat with a spoon always? Yes, it is fine. You can eat with a spoon every single day of your life. No problem. But what I what I say with myself that if Prophet ﷺ has eaten with the with his hands, you could consider I want to be like the Prophet so I can eat with my hands. I like to eat with my hands. And my culture, it uh, you know we eat with our hands anyway, so I will eat with, them, with my hands. But if I'm at a restaurant or something and there are knives and forks and everyone's eating like that, I will eat with the knife and fork. But then again, if I'm eating pizza for for example again, and even if it's at the restaurant, right, it, it, to eat it with the uh, knife and fork it seems a little bit strange. So then we can eat that with our hands, yeah. So depending on the situation as well. Uh, depending on culture, uh, you can uh, you know eat with a spoon, eat with your hands, eat with whatever. That's not a problem. This is not considered bid'ah. Um, there is no dalil for something. They are... Okay, that someone's answering another question. Can you clarify the example of fasting qada in the winter? I missed what you said. I said basically, um, not qada. Like if I decide that now is Ramadan and I want to miss the next, uh, for example, summertime. It's Ramadan, right? I, I don't want to do, do my fast in Ramadan because it's summer. It's long days. So I will wait until the winter and I will do my Ramadan fast that, that time. This is considered bid'ah because I've changed Ramadan and made it in the winter. I'm not allowed to do that. But my qada, if I delay it, it's not allowed to delay too much, by the way. You should do as much as, uh, you know, as soon as you can. For example, the uh, pregnant woman or the uh, menstruating woman, they will not be fasting, right? It's uh, ha harmful for them or difficult for them. Uh, harmful for the pregnant woman and uh, difficult or, or not allowed. Haram for the uh, menstruating woman to fast, right? So as soon as Ramadan ends, they should try and do their fast. They should try and make it up, right? They shouldn't let it build up too much and say, okay, now it's summer, the late days are long, I'm going to wait uh, till later on. They shouldn't, right? But if they do and they say, oh, it's summer, we'll find it difficult, and I'm looking after my children, I have this, uh, there's a few excuses. Then they can do it later. That's fine. The qada, is, it's okay. But to actually change Ramadan from the summer to the winter, this is what is bid'ah. This will not be allowed at all. What is the position on Islam considering music, uh, music utterly and completely haram? The deaf was allowed in uh, joyous occasions or in party occasions uh, by the women. This was uh, what was allowed by Rasulullah Apart from that, uh, it will be completely not allowed. The dalil of that and the uh, explanation of that is very lengthy and very long, inshallah. So uh, you can find out or you can uh, you know research from some of the scholars of the Salaf. Uh, after Asr Salah, is it okay to do evening adhkar at once as well as Fajr Salah is morning adhkar? Yes, so straight away after Fajr, you can do the morning adhkar. Um, straight away after Asr, whether you do it straight away after Asr or a little bit later, right? There, there is ikhtilaf on this. However, the uh, time is uh, after Asr until Maghrib time, just before uh, you know, Salat al-Maghrib. This is a good time to do the uh, evening adhkar. Generally, I myself uh, do it after the Asr, since a lot of the time I found that if I do delay it, I do tend to forget it, right? And we, we forget things and I'm working and uh, so on and so forth, right? 
it turns out something gets in the way. But when you're doing your salah and you want to spend five minutes after the salah to do it straight away, um, this uh, could be uh, this uh, using using this um, uh, you know method to do it, it will be perfectly fine. But for example, if I'm uh, musafir, I'm traveling and I have shortened and combined dhuhr and asr together at the time of dhuhr. I'm not going to do the evening adhkar at that time. Rather, I will wait till after asr, just before maghrib, and do the evening adhkar at that time. So I hope that uh, clears up this question. Uh, only the way it's celebrated by some people is wrong, the birthdays. Uh, Allah uh, may Allah wa ta'ala grant us all understanding and hidayah. Rather, um, we were going to find another hadith that will come soon. This, I think this refers to the birthdays, right? That the way people, some people celebrate uh, the milad or the birthdays is wrong, right? Completely, uh, it, it could be completely wrong, right? Not just the way some people celebrate it. Now, we will find another hadith that tells us that to stay away from doubtful matters. No more questions, inshallah. There are uh, quite a few. There are too many. We don't want to do that. So because it is imitating the kuffar, number one, and because, uh, you know, it uh, goes towards the, the, the gray matters or the doubtful matters, we need to leave it alone. Uh, who is the reciter? I don't know who the reciter is. If you can ask the admin, inshallah, they will be able to respond. I went to the message yesterday for taraweeh and prayed it in sets of four rakah instead of two. It is a form of bid'ah. Sets of four rakah meaning two and two. Uh, as in two, and then assalamu alaikum, and then two again, and then taking a slight break. This is called the uh, tarweeha or the istiraha. This is the rest. This is completely fine. But if you're saying that you prayed four, as in you prayed two, they made it a shahud and then prayed another two without a salam, this is a bid'ah. This is not allowed. Um, this is the only masjid that can go close to my house. Is this haram? Uh, it, it is uh, It is bid'ah. Therefore, it's, it is completely not allowed. Uh, this this method of tarawih where you don't make a salam after the two rakah, it would not be allowed at all. But if it's two, and then assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, and then another two, and then they take a slight break, this is fine. This is called tarweeha. This is where tarawih comes from. You pray four rakah, and then you take a slight break. You pray another four, take a slight break, and so on. Right? Uh, can we do qada for missed prayer? Um, that day, uh, or if you if you remember something, immediately pray it. Yeah. So this is allowed to do qada in this manner. Um, so a lot of the uh, ulama of the salaf, they do tell us that if we make a qada of an intentionally missed prayer, this is not allowed. You're not supposed to do something like that because the salah needs to be in its prescribed time. So uh, I hope that uh, you know you can understand from that. It was brought to them, you omitted in kuffar. Yes, the birthday, yes, right. It is fine to eat a spoon. I mentioned all this again. In India, it's very common. Doctors are de declaring a miscarriage has happened as there is no heart beat in the embryo in the sixth or eighth week and they give medicine to the newly conceived. Uh, these are hadith, right? The is what what is forty days. We explained this yesterday, by the way. Um, if you go back to the hadith, uh, the soul is blown into the uh, fetus after forty days, not one hundred twenty. Okay, be careful with this one. The fatwa uh, has been based on the misunderstanding of the first hadith, right? Allahu alam. This is my understanding of this, and uh, I believe that this is the sahih understanding. And if you uh, look at science as well, and you uh, for you know you take the hadith and you apply the science to it, right? Then you can get the hadith that is in Bukhari. The explanation or, or the text of Bukhari matches with science, and the uh, the word that was added later on the notfa it doesn't uh, match with this hadith. Uh, however, this uh, fatwa that you're asking about the uh, abortion and so on. Um, this one we need to ask specifically for this specific case. I don't think this is the forum. This is the perfect place to be asking a question such as this, a detailed question like that. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for uh, to make ease. Let uh, this person, whoever is suffering like this in this manner uh, with conception or uh, with thyroid, diabetes, all of these issues, um, inshallah, do also your ruqya, inshallah. Do also ruqya bi'idhin lahi ta'ala. You, you will find a great benefit from that. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. It is permissible to make, or is it permissible to make dua? in sujood in your own language okay if it is a sajda outside of salah just a sajda of shukur or a sajda of istighfar for example this would be allowed within the fard salah the sunnah salahs it will not be allowed within the nawafil the scholars have a difference of opinion the one that doesn't know the duas in arabic at all and uh, they're completely new to islam or they haven't learned anything like that number one they should try to learn and number two while they are learning maybe they'll be allowed to make dua in their language Right, but they should try and their best to do it in Arabic. This will, of course, be better. I did dhikr last night and I said 1000 times uh, a certain uh, dhikr uh, and so on with other dua and uh, Surah Qadr as much as I could. Nobody told me this specific number is that allowed? Yes, yeah. But what was the uh, intention of doing uh, Surah Qadr so, or Surah uh, Inna Anzalna that many times, right? Or so many times. Rather, let us follow the Sunnah where uh, or the hadith where it says reciting Surah Al Ikhlas. 10 times uh, gains you a house in Jannah. 
20 times gains you two houses, 30 times gains you get three houses. Let us try to follow these hadith instead of uh, Al-Qadr. Of course, no doubt, reciting Quran, even Surah Al-Qadr is a great uh, blessing, but reciting this verse, seeking Laylatul Qadr, is not really from the Sunnah, right? Better for me to do something that is. Rather, Astaghfirullah a thousand times or another dhikr a thousand times, this is perfectly fine, no problem. I can do 1,000, I can do 2,000, whatever. But let me do as much as I can. But the Surah Al-Qadr that you mentioned, we don't really find this uh, anywhere. Um, but if it's just for the purpose of reciting Quran, so then why do I just only do Surah Al-Qadr? Let me do other surahs as well. Or let me do something that has evidence in the Quran, which is uh, Surah uh, you know, Al-Ikhlas. Um, by the way, it is not a bid'ah the way that you've done it, but uh, you know, let me look for something that is better than that, which is uh, what I find in the Hadith. Um, the spoon again, the third time, fourth time, this, the question has been asked. Inshallah, ask one time and we will get through uh, to those, inshallah. If, uh, if there are certain cultural practices that are definitely bid'ah, many people do it. Do you have an obligation to explain, even if we think the people will not change their practice anyway? Yes, I should try to explain as much as I can. If they change or not, uh, inshallah, uh, it's not my duty to make the people change. It is my duty to convey the message. This is how Rasulullah taught us. We must uh, uh, convey the message. We must t tell the people, teach the people. And if they change, they change. If they do not, this is upon their own heads. Whom can they... I don't understand the, 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 some mistakes here in the question. Taraweeh on her own when she's at home alone. If you mean that can the woman pray Taraweeh herself? Yes, we have answered this question yesterday as well. You can pray Taraweeh at home and it is better to pray at home and you can pray your Salat al Taraweeh yourself. Uh, what is the position of Islam about playing music? We said music is haram, it's not allowed at all. The daf uh, would be allowed in uh, joyous occasions in a marriage or something like this um, and uh, played by the woman, uh, inshallah. How do we manage our spouse doing bid'ah, which is affecting us, like insist insisting on dhikr together after fard, salah? Teach, teach. Show the example, show the, uh, you know, go back to basics. Why do we do any ibadah that we do? Because Allah told us to do, or Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us to do. And if Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't, or Allah didn't, then we can't do. Explain in a beautiful manner, in a nice manner. Rather than saying, oh, what you're doing is bid'ah and kufur and shirk and it's not allowed. And If I go like this, people will be against us, right? Especially our spouse. So explain to them nicely in a you know gentle manner and say, look, you can do it. That's not a problem at all. But me, I don't feel comfortable with this because I don't find that Rasulullah SAW, he did it or even uh, these uh, Sahaba or the Salaf, they did it. So I, I don't want to do it in this manner, right? Um, I'm not going to go to an extreme. Some scholars have said uh, that uh, if you are married to Ahlul Bid'ah, you're not allowed to stay with them. If they insist on doing that, you must leave them. But I'm not going to go to that extreme. But our job, we must try and uh, keep... Um, we, we must try and keep uh, teaching, keep, uh, uh, you know, keep educating. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. Um, a spoon again. Subhanallah, bihamdi, please, with the spoon. Relax. Uh, I often heard people say there is a good bid'ah and a bad bid'ah. Imam al-Shafi'i, he even mentioned about the good bid'ah, and then the example was given of the, of the taraweeh salah, right? But again, if you consider that a bid'ah, how will it be a bid'ah if Rasulullah he prayed one night and then two nights, and then the third night he said, no, I'm not coming, because if I do, maybe Allah will make it wajib. So he did do it, right? And the sahaba, they followed, and they did it themselves, right? So that's what they refer to. Rather, we stay away from all sorts of bid'ah, whether good or bad bid'ah. Let us stay away from it. Uh, it is better. Um, and we would not consider taraweeh uh, to be uh, a bid'ah in that sense. Uh, can I sleep for tahajjud during last days? I don't know what that means, but tahajjud means that I, I went to sleep and I woke up to pray. This means tahaj, uh, tahajjud. And if I didn't sleep, it means I'm doing qiyamul layl instead. Right? It's, just, it's the same prayer, prayer of the night, but it is uh, just a different uh, way of uh, you know, praying. So one uh, of them in the night prayer, the Qiyamul Layl, right? Taraweeh is also part of Qiyamul Layl, by the way. So Qiyamul Layl means to stand and pray in the night, right? Any prayer that I do in the night is Qiyamul Layl. But Tahajjud is the type of Qiyamul Layl that I sleep, I wake up, and then I pray. This is called Tahajjud. Because Hajada or Tahajjada means you slept, you woke up, and then you prayed again, right? This means Tahajjud. How can I increase khushur in my Salah? Uh, try to think about Allah and focus on Allah. Any blessings of Allah, Allah gave you the, the meanings of the words that you are reading, concentrate on that. If you don't know the meanings of Fatiha and the surahs you're reading, learn the meanings of that and focus on the meaning during the salah. You will find a bit more khushur, uh, If you should be just awake, no, you should sleep. You should sleep a little bit in the night and then you should wake up again and pray tahajjud. This is the best, uh, better way. But if you know that, okay, if I sleep, I will not wake up, then better to stay awake and pray. Now, 
Um, <clears throat> Examples of uh, good bid'ah. We mentioned the tarawih, but uh, again, we said it would not be considered exactly like uh, a bid'ah in that sense. Praying with like Maghrib, according to the Hanafi Madhab, is correct with dua, il qunut. I'm not going to go into the madahib, okay? The ikhtilaf or the difference of the madahib, I'm not going to go into that in this uh, QA or, or any of the QAs. There are different madahib. I want to respect all of the ulama. And without uh, you know bringing all the dalil, I can't give it justice. So I will not be going into the difference there. If someone prays in a different manner, the witr or even the rest of the salawat. For example, they say Allahu Akbar, and when they go into ruku, they don't say Allahu Akbar again. I'm not going to go into these differences. Even myself, if I do, uh, you know, say Allahu Akbar again, and if I pray two rak'ah, I make a salam, and then pray one rak'ah for witr, right? Uh, as in the three rak'ah of witr, but um, pray two, make a break, and then pray uh, the, the 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 one rak'ah by itself. This, this is what I do myself, but I'm not going to go into those because uh, these are differences of the fiqh madahib. And uh, they can be valid, all of them. And we're not going to make someone mubtadi' uh, because they follow a different madhab. This is not how it works. Um, during the class hour, if there's an urgency, can I take my phone to the bathroom and listen? No, don't take your phone inside the bathroom. Um, if you leave the uh, phone outside at least, because the name of Allah will be mentioned, the name of Rasulullah and the Quran will be mentioned. Um, better than that is not to take it at all. And uh, there is recordings uh, that will be on the YouTube channel. You can uh, access the recording and just go through what you missed. Uh, again, sleeping during Tajid. If you can ask the question one time, please, and then uh, leave it. We will answer it, inshallah. Uh, Nafal are two types. Ishraq, two rak'ah after sunrise, and duha, two rak'ah around noon before dhuhr. Uh, is any of these uh, salah bid'ah? They are not bid'ah. Rasulullah he did uh, this type of salah. Can I sleep for tajud again? Can I join neighboring masjid from my house? No, from the house you cannot. It, uh, unless the jama'ah continues and there are people making rows until they're at your house, right? And then they're, they're even inside your house with you, then you can join them. Otherwise, you shouldn't join another masjid doing tajud. Otherwise, I could say, I want to join the haram. As soon as the imam is praying in Makkah, I'm going to join him and pray. Uh, you know, this logic doesn't work. Or during Corona, we're going to make Jum'ah. One person in the, the imam in their own house and everyone is in their own house. Put the TV on and then everyone pray Jum'ah behind the imam. It doesn't work like this. Yeah, the, the Jama'ah, the congregation is the congregation. The, however long the lines are. If the lines continue onto the street, I can pray in the street. It will be part of the Jama'ah. But if I say, okay, the Jama'ah is all the way over there in the masjid. I'm going two streets away. I will pray in the street. It will not be part of the Jama'ah. Can I pray one rakah with her keeping intention in the last two set of tarawih rakah that I pray? It is possible, but uh, it's better not to because you want to follow the imam and the hadith says that follow the imam until he finishes the, the, the prayer. So you follow uh, along with the imam, however the imam is praying. <clears throat> Imitating kufr is celebrating birthdays like the kufr do, gathering for dhikr, salawat, reflecting signs of uh, times of the birth of the beloved. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're trying to draw in closeness to the Lord uh, and to the beloved. That's different. You're saying it's different, but we already discussed during the uh, explanation of the hadith that doing something new to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and of course, by extension to Rasulullah, this is also considered bid'ah. Right, so uh, please go through the uh, slides again, inshallah. Um, I hope that will clear that up. Um, if we leave with it to read later and forget and remember the next day, do we have to read the entire Aisha prayer as qada? No, you do not. Um, the with it is not part of the Aisha, right? The with it is not part of the Aisha, and according to the more correct opinion. It is not uh, a wajib like uh, if you missed that, but the hadith mentions that uh, the Prophet Sallam, he would make sure that he always prays these two sunan and he mentioned the sunnah of uh, Fajr and the Witr, right? He mentioned Witr as a sunnah uh, in this, uh, you know, in this hadith. So uh, we could say that if you forget it, um, all the time you don't do it, then it would be considered uh, something that's uh, aib and something that could be blameworthy. But if you forget it once, uh, you know, here or there, uh, you don't have to repeat the entire Aisha prayer. Uh, can you accept a birthday gift from someone? Um, better to explain to them that, look, I don't celebrate my birthday. Uh, you know, I would prefer not to receive a gift on my birthday. You can give me a gift if you'd like out of love and so on. But I would prefer not to accept birthday gifts in this manner. Right. But if someone says, you know, I want to give you this and, uh, you know, I love you and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, there should be, shouldn't be any harm in accepting a gift. Um, just like uh, on the occasion of Christmas, if someone gives you a gift, you explain to them, I don't celebrate this. But if you want to give me a gift, look, I'm happy to accept a gift. Rasulullah accept gift uh, accepted gifts, right? But again, me giving a gift now, this is something different. 
it's, it's Christmas, I'm going to give my neighbors because they give me Christmas gifts, I'm going to give them. No, I don't do that. Rather, I wait till Eid. I give them Eid gifts and I give them even something better than they even give me to increase their love for Islam or love for me or love for uh, or showing them that Muslims are good and Muslims are, you know, give gifts and so on and so forth, right? It is allowed to eat out on one's birthday. Again, if it's as a form of celebration or something like that, it can be considered imitating the kuffar. Why not eat, uh, you know, eat out um, just with the family uh, at any other time, right? To say uh, that I'm doing this for my birthday again, uh, I would prefer uh, not to do that because we're allowing these things, right? Uh, one by one by one by one. We're going to allow gift. Then we're going to allow eating out. Then we're going to allow a cake. Then we're going to allow this and that. We're going to say, no, no, none of this is kufr. None of this is shirk. None of this is haram in and of itself. When we add all of this, what happens? Then we're going to say, oh, let's have a party. Then we become as if it's like the uh, kufar anyway. Right. So uh, we don't want to do that. We don't want to open these doors at all. So rather we say, don't uh, you know, be going out for a meal like that. Don't be getting the cake. Don't be doing this because one by one by one, they might be OK. But then it leads to others. Right. And we want to stay far away from anything that leads to something that would become even a bid'ah. He's reciting Yasin with uh, Mubin to seek something bid'ah. If you find it in a hadith, you can go and do it. And I haven't found it in a hadith. If you find it in a hadith, you can do it. But if you don't find it in a hadith, you shouldn't do that. It will be a bid'ah to seek a certain thing, reciting surat Yasin. Uh, reading surahs and du'as X number of times to seek something from Allah. Um, if it is because you think, if I do this, I will definitely get this. It will be a bid'ah. But if it is, for example, someone is practicing their own ruqya. Ruqya is uh, to seek a cure or to seek something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Um, Prophet ﷺ said, do your ruqya as long as there's no shirk involved in it. You can do uh, what you'd like. For example, someone's uh, you know uh, they are doing the ruqya and they find that if I do uh, you know recite Surah Al-Fatiha eleven times, then I find some sort of relief. Then they can do Surah Fatiha eleven times. There's not a problem with that. But if they believe that oh, if I do eleven times, definitely this will happen. That will happen. I will get this blessing and that blessing. This is not uh, something that is allowed. What is the views of putting hands down in prostration? Should hands be down or folded? Uh, I don't understand this in prostration is in, in the sajda the hand should be uh, you know on the floor flat like that um, I don't understand the question uh, I believe I might have misunderstood that um, please would a dua which you listen to on YouTube and say I mean be answered of course any dua whether it's on YouTube or whether it's something that's uh, written or was someone forwarded on WhatsApp you say I mean it will be accepted and the angels will make a dua for you likewise can a woman pray tarawih at home and qiyamul layl in the masjid she can do that uh, or you know this way or that way there is no problem in that um, but I say better to pray at home the reward of praying at the home for the women is more and uh, the uh, uh, Qiyamul Layl, going out for Qiyamul Layl, if it is safe and she can go with the mahram late at night, then fine. But if she's going alone, better to avoid that as well. Please increase volume. Un um, unfortunately, I don't know how I can increase the volume of my microphone. Uh, can I join Maghrib, or Maghrib and Isha prayer in my house if it is raining? Um, if you're at home, there is no hardship. So you should not be joining the Maghrib and Isha prayer uh, in your house. Um, the you need to look at the uh, reason that uh, uh, that was given for shortening mm -hmm. the, the joining the prayers. Bismillahi Taala. If I can just mute this one again, um, can we separate sajda for dua? I don't know what that means. If you mean can we make uh, dua in sajda, you can make uh, dua in every sajda, even in the fard prayer in Arabic. You can say, for example, Allahumma inna ka'afu in tuhibul afafafani, Allahumma gfirli, and so on and so forth. What is the YouTube? The YouTube is uh, Ulum Academy. Ulum Academy UK, I believe. Uh, this is the YouTube channel for the uh, uh, for the uh, academy for the courses that we do. Um, can we omit Witr Salah last ten nights and then do it in Tahajjud Ustad? This is the best way, right? Uh, Witr should be the last prayer you pray in the night. Yeah, don't do Witr at Taraweeh. Rather wait and uh, do it afterwards at the Tahajjud. Taala. Some people I've seen, and this has become something quite common, is that when the Imam is praying Witr uh, in the Taraweeh, they join that Witr and then they add one more Raka'ah, right? This could be allowed, but better if you're not going to pray the Witr, you leave after the Taraweeh finishes and then you come, you pray your Qiyamul Layl and then you pray your Witr or the Tahajjud, you pray your Tahajjud or Qiyamul Layl and then you do the Witr after that. If we are praying Quran and someone starts watching TV in the same room, is this sin? When the Quran is recited, the command from Allah is فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصُتُوا Not listen to it, but استمعوا, concentrate and focus on the Quran. وَأَنْصُتُوا Be quiet. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ So you'll receive rahmah. So uh, it is uh, not allowed uh, to be, uh, it is a sin to be uh, making other noise or focusing on something else while Quran is being recited. Uh, and uh, it can even be... Uh, 
um, what do you call it? It won't be bid'ah, of course, but it will be a, a, a sin, as you mentioned. It can even be a sin. Can I accept discounts and free food from businesses that were given to me as a birthday present? Again, if you want to uh, accept something that someone else has given you, this is one thing. But if you want to yourself put yourself forward in this uh, uh, in this manner to say, okay, I'm going to do this, right? I'm going to get this. I'm going to uh, you know sign up for all of these places that will give me this because of my birthday. This is something that I would say you shouldn't do. Like, for example, some restaurants you go to, if you tell them, oh, it's my birthday, they will give you a little cake or something like that. This, I would say, don't do that. But if they say, okay, you have a membership, and every day uh, in every, on your birthday, we're going to give you uh, a sweet or something like that, la ba's, inshallah. But uh, once you open these doors, right, it opens the door for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Better to avoid it. But uh, inshallah, there won't be uh, sin in just once uh, and twice, something like that. Inshallah, I hope... Uh, uh, I can give justice to this ruling as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all hidayah. Standing, uh, should hands be folded or down while standing in? Itidal, I don't know what you mean by itidal. Uh, as in when you stand up again uh, after saying Sami Allahu liman hamida. So then uh, you would uh, leave your hands. Right, uh, if you, uh, you know, look at the hadith of the prayer of the Prophet sallam, you will find the answers there, inshallah. Someone, uh, one of the sisters, uh, Sister Hamida, has posted the link to the YouTube channel. Barakallahu feeki, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a means of uh, acceptance from you and everyone who joins uh, and finds the channel through that link. I mean, can we join Maghrib Isha in the summer? Isha tends to be very late in the West. Uh, better not to uh, join it. Speak to your local uh, imam about this, however. Inshallah, I don't want to give a generic rule. Even if we say West, uh, I don't want to give a generic rule. Myself, uh, sometimes we pray Aisha late at night, uh, 11, 11, 15, 11, 30, uh, and we will continue doing that as long as Allah gives us hayat, inshallah. I think uh, asking about hands folded, uh, no. So I think i'tidal is uh, once you're getting, getting up from rukur, that could be. Um, but uh, Imam Malik, uh, he uh, gave the opinion of uh, standing uh, even in the qiyam with the hands down. But again, this is depending on the madhab. Why do people read Yasi when visiting the grave? They believe it brings some sort of uh, benefit or barakah, and we didn't find this in, in any of the hadith, so we shouldn't do that. What are the rulings for women to go to religious congregations, the rules, because some people try to stop their housewomen? They should be allowed to go if there is no fitna, right? Um, if they will benefit from it, if they will learn something from it, they should be able to go. Allah, Rasulullah, he encouraged uh, seeking knowledge, right? The Sahaba that would sometimes come to Aisha, radiallahu anha. the male Sahaba would come and learn at the feet of Aisha, radiallahu anha. she would be behind her hijab, behind the veil, a screen, right? And they would be sitting there and they would be listening. So if she's teaching in this manner, so what about going to a dars? Of course, it will be allowed to go to a dars. Uh, is the prayer valid if Sahu was not performed? Yes, it will be valid, uh, insha'Allah. Uh, it is said that Allah descends to the earth during the last third of the night. How do you measure a third of the night? Do we take it as from Maghrib until dawn and divide it into three parts? Um, let us just uh, make it a little bit easier on ourselves. Consider it a couple of hours before the Fajr, inshallah. That will be the easiest way. Of course, if the nights are long, like we have like uh, 12 hours in the night, you can just divide it into three and then uh, make it in the last third. You can do that, but that's extra takalluf. Make it in the last two, three hours of the night, inshallah. We ask Allah to uh, allow us uh, the uh, ibadat in the last third. Uh, no more questions, inshallah. Whatever is here, I will answer and then we'll conclude. Uh, inshallah, I have actually delayed uh, a bit too much. Um, is the prayer valid? Yes, uh, if Allah descends. There are two hadith in regards to the matter of standing after ruku'ah. Yes, so that's why I said go with your madhab, whatever your madhab says, inshallah, you better to go with that. The fiqhi questions I'm generally keeping, uh, you know, to your madhab, you stick to your madhab, you don't uh, uh, have to just uh, be following what one person says over another. Some message pray Aisha earlier than the time. Is this allowed? No, you cannot pray salah before the time has entered. Uh, is it wrong to pray with her? With Taraweeh and pray it again later after the Hajjud. Yes, you cannot pray with it two times. It is not allowed. So if you have joined, uh, already prayed with it, and then you pray more, right? And if they pray with it again, then you have to add one more raka'ah with your uh, with it in the Tahajjud uh, the second time. I have seen it is going more to the side of folding hands, as there are no hadith mentioned. Rasulullah put his hands down. Again, the you will go to your madhab, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all uh, understanding. Jazakumullah khairan. Third part of the night is around the time of suhoor or from midnight onwards. No, even, even midnight would be half of the night, isn't it? That's why it's called midnight, the middle of the night. Um, however, it's not obviously exactly 12 o'clock that's midnight, but uh, you know, around that time. In any case, uh, the time of suhoor is, is, is better, right? And suhoor should be done, done towards the later 
part of the night, just before, literally just before Fajr, this is the best time for your suhoor. Um, because the hadith says that to make your suhoor as late as possible and your iftar as early as possible. And nasheed haram in Islam, nasheed will be allowed as long as there's no music uh, contained within those, bi ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this final question uh, to uh, grant us tafaqquh fi deen, uh, uh, more understanding of fiqh, uh, more understanding of the uh, rulings of our religion. Aqulu qawli hadha, subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. See you next week, bi ta'ala, for the continuation of our uh, durus. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.